Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Luis Camacho, and today I'm going to talk to you about a fun study that we conducted in the Ecuadorian Amazon, where we address the mechanisms by which prey may engage in mutualistic associations with their would-be predators. We know that prey in, in, uh, employ an array of behaviors to avoid predation, which perhaps the most recognizable ones is escaping from a predator or hiding from a predator, which are arguably simple behaviors, right? But animals may also av avoid predation by engaging in very complicated behaviors that involve mutually beneficial interactions with other species. And perhaps one example that you may recognize is the mutualistic interaction between sap-sucking amibtrans and ants. Here what happens is that amibtrans produce produce this sugary solution called honeydew and they offer it to the ants and the ants take it and in exchange protect the, the, the amibtrans from a variety of, of predators and actually the ants are very good at it. However, this comes with a caveat for, for the amibtrans and this is because ants themselves are major predators of invertebrate communities and this is especially so in tropical rainforests where the ant amibtran associations are most common. So this poses a challenge for amibtrans because in, in order to associate with their, their, with, their, with their ant partners, they first need to dissuade them from predating upon the amibtrans in the first place. So we thought, what are the, the, the mechanisms behind this ant appeasement? And we thought about two possibilities. The one possibility is that ants may refrain from attacking the amibtrans in response to the immediate stimulus of the sugary reward. Let's call it the, the amibtran bribe to the ants. An alternative is that even in, in the absence of honeydew, ants may recognize their amibtran partners uh, and, and spare them, and this may be maybe because an innate or even unlearned behavior. So we tested these ideas and focused on tree hoppers, which is this group that is very close to my heart. Tree hoppers are a group of sap-sucking insects, and they all belong to the family Membracidae. <coughs> And they are mostly recognized by the diverse and often <laughs> very bizarre shapes of their thorax. Believe me, Google them, you won't be disappointed. But what is pertinent for our study is that different taxa exhibit various propensities to associate with the ants, and these may be broadly classified as, classified as, as, as follows. First, we have the non-mutualist tree hoppers, uh, which avoid ants or actively repel them. Then we also have the partially mutualist species, which may be found associated with the ants, but they are often alone or in small, gr in in small groups. And then we have the fully, mu fully mutualistic tree hoppers, tree hoppers, let's call them, and, and these are often found forming these very large aggregations of adults and nymphs that all being attended by the ants. Okay, so to test us our, our, our hypothesis, we set up a bait experiment in the Amazon lowlands in eastern Ecuador. And we studied the behavior of ants when facing a sure reward from a tree hopper and a novel partner. So we did so by setting a, a two by two experiment that combines the baits cons consisting of tree hoppers and termite baits with and without another droplet of honey. Here the termites represented a non-partner species of the ants and the droplet of honey simulated the production of honeydew. Uh, we also used a variety of tree hopper genera with various degrees of, of, of mutualism, as I, I, I explained before. And all these tree hoppers were locally collected, so they represent a community that naturally occurs with the community of ants that we are analyzing, right? And, and also baits were dead by freezing to prevent decomposition, as well as preserving the chemi chemical integrity of the baits, which is also important for when studying ant behavior. Okay, so what did we find? So this graph shows the proportion of predated baits across time after being located by the ants. And the analysis excludes non-mutualist tree hoppers. So let's focus on the dotted line, uh, on the dotted red line, which represents termites without honey. And we can see that ants immediately consume the, the termite baits. These poor things they did not have a chance. And now in contrast, let's focus the so on the solid red line, which shows the pattern for termites with an added droplet of honey. And now we can see that in this case, ants often refrain from attacking the termites even after depleting the, the honey. So this is very interesting because it shows the incredible appeasing effect of sugar on ants. Let's remember that ants could have eaten the termites while simultaneously consuming the honey at, at any point. But not only they did not do that, but they spread the baits even after depleting the sugar. So this is very, very interesting. Now, the other interesting result here is shown by the dotted blue line, which represents tree hoppers without an added, uh, the added droplet of honey. And it shows that compared to the termites, ants refrain uh, from predating upon the tree hoppers, even if these have no honey to offer. 
And this is intriguing because, you know, predators would eat anything if they can, especially ants, which are just a force of nature and go out and destroy everything if they can. So the interesting bit here is to explain why the ants did not attack the tree hoppers, despite being as immobile and as defenseless as the termites. And we think this is evidence of some degree of pattern recognition. And this is further supported by our next result. These graphs also show the proportion of baits predated across time after being found by the ants, but focus only on tree hopper baits. Uh, different panels show different degrees of, 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 of the propensity of tree hoppers to uh, associate with the ants, where the left panel is non it represents non-mutualist tree hoppers, the panel in the middle partially mutualist species, and the panel to the right mutualist species. And we can see that ants were mo way more likely to predate upon non-mutualist tree hoppers compared to the groups that have some, have some degree of ant mutualism. So it appears that ants are able to recognize the potential for honeydew in their mutual partners, either maybe through an innate or a learned behavior. Okay, so what does all this mean? We know that honeydew is a resource of vital importance of ants in tropical canopies. And, and here we know ants rely heavily on the supply of, of honeydew to, to, to meet the demands, the nutritional demands of their colonies. So exploiting the nutritional value of honeydew is the main factor prompting the ants to spare the emitrant partners. And here we show that the mechanisms mediating this ant appeasement is the, the, the emitrant bribe and the ants' ability to recognize their emitrant partners. However, what is interesting is that these two mechanisms are operating at two different timescales. You see, the appeasing effect of honeydew involves ants' response to an immediate stimulus, and thus it is operating in ecological time. In contrast, the ants' innate or learned ability to recognize their mutual partners has to be an inherited trait, and it thus is operating at an evolutionary time. So it seems that ant appeasement provides then evidence of a behavioral mechanism that is mediating the interaction between ants and tree, hop and tree hoppers and emitrants at the ecological and evolutionary timescales, which is so, so cool and is something that I did not consider when I started my PhD, but you see. So yeah, this is, this is all I have to say for now. Um, I want to, uh, I, I, I want to first thank my collaborators, I want to f thank my funding agencies, and thank you for, uh, for your attention. I hope you've, you have found the, uh, the topic interesting. Thank you very much.